is focused on uh, the K-12 educator and artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm here with a lovely group of colleagues who are all K-12 educators, some in higher ed as well. And we're going to talk to you today a little bit about how, um, like with many new advancements in technology and tools that students use inside and outside the school, um, it often elevates the importance of the teacher. Um, and sometimes we get a little anxious or worried or excited about all of these tools that come into our hands, right into the hands of children at school. Uh, and we get worried about what the role of the teacher is going to be. Um, but we find, you know, working in schools that when new technology and tools are introduced, it really elevates how important teachers really are. And that's what we're going to talk to you about today. Uh, my name is Lorraine Radice. I am I'm a professor here at Hofstra University. I'm also the director of literacy in Long Beach Public Schools. Um, and as I said, I'm joined with uh, my friends and colleagues who will introduce themselves as they go through their portions of the presentation. Um, so most of our conversation today is really going to focus on chat GBC, uh, which came onto the scene last November and has become extremely popular uh, in businesses, industries, and education. And we wanted to start by making sure that all of us are on the same page as to what ChatGBT does uh, and what it can produce for us. So we're actually going to start by welcoming you through ChatGPT. So I invite you to look at the screen and move your eyes as fast as you can. Okay, fine. Thanks. So here ChatGPT is a, a dialogue model tool where users put in a prompt and then you're going to see that it's going to generate a letter or a speech to welcome you to this presentation. Thanks, go ahead. Okay. Now, that is a pretty long welcome, so we wanted to shorten it. So we interacted with the tool and said make it under a hundred words. And we're trying to be funny and add some levity on this rainy Tuesday. So we said add a joke. Today we're diving into the world of AI and education, and I promise no AI will be grading your work today. Laughing emoji. Just clean my name. We try. <laughs> okay. Um, but that basically is what ChatGPT can do. You put in a prompt uh, based on what her output you're looking for. You can interact with the tool, and it generates ideas in front of you in real time. And we'll see a lot of examples of the use of ChatGPT as we go through our presentation today. Um, so I'm going to start us off. I'm going to continue to introduce ChatGPT and his role in education. Uh, and then I'm going to move into focusing a little bit about how it could be a tool as a reading partner. And then Mr. Jones, who is an elementary STEM teacher, will talk about his experiences with the importance of language when using ChatGPT GPT with young children. And then Ms. Weiss, who is a high school English teacher and I'm the essay coordinator, coordinator, will speak to you about chat GPC and the writing and research process. Ms. Tercy, who is the director of science, will talk to you about tools for differentiation when using AI and how it could be used as a planning tool for teachers. And then Dr. Kylie Rendon, who is an executive director of technology and innovation, will talk about the legal and ethical concerns with AI and then he'll branch out into some other apps that include AI in addition to ChatGPT. So there have been many advancements in tools, as I mentioned earlier, um, that have maybe sparked some nervousness and curiosity, right, in, in history. So if we think back to the calculator, I'm sure that made and maybe still makes the math teacher is nervous about kids not practicing fact fluency or mental math or having to do, you know, exercise in numeracy. Uh, without leaning on the calculator, but the opposite is true. Kids still need to learn those early skills, and they also need to have a skill set in order to approach using a calculator, especially one as complex as this one. And then we, uh, we introduced Google onto the scene, right? And many people were probably excited and curious when Google came onto the scene, but a little nervous thinking that it was going to give us all the information in the world that we needed. We wouldn't have to fact check. We wouldn't have to cross, you know, sources. Um, but that's not true either, right? We we have a full model of instruction to teach students how to use Google as a source of information. Um, and again, elevates the importance of the teacher. And now uh, Google has a friend, ChatGPT, which stands for Chat Generative Pre-trained and Transformer. Um, what distinguishes ChatGPT from Google 
It's that you both can prompt for information in both sources. Um, but ChatGPT, like I said before, is built to dialogue with the user. So it interacts with you based on what you need. Um, some other information about ChatGPT, it was released in November um, and has become extremely popular with the number of users. Um, it's reached over 100 million users. I'm going to show you in a minute how that compares to some of our most popular social media sites. Um, it can understand and generate answers in multiple languages and different levels of complexity. Um, but one thing that's really important to consider when using ChatGPT, especially in the classroom when teaching students, is that the information is not always accurate. Um, so what it essentially does, it curates information from the internet and brings it into this one singular source. But when you're asking or interacting with ChatGPT, it will often say to you, make sure that you fact check or look to other sources or consult a professional. Um, there's even a disclaimer when you sign up for an account that lets you know that it's in the research phase, it's not fully developed, to really stress the importance of not using it as a singular source. Um, the other piece to consider with inaccuracy is that it currently does not pull information that has been outputted after September of 2021. So if you were to ask um, who visited Travis Kelsey at the Chiefs game on Sunday, uh, it might tell you someone other than Taylor Swift because it doesn't know that. Is anybody else really excited about this story? That's probably a place I'm living right? Um, so I wouldn't know that because it happened just a couple of days ago. Um, so just, you know, light bulb moment, contemporary current events in school, you know, is a really good thing to keep kids plugged into the world. And they're, they're not able to really use ChatGPT to access that information. Um, so that being said about its usership, uh, just to give you context of how popular ChatGPT has become, um, it took five days in 2022, uh, last fall, to reach 1 billion viewers. You can look across that chart in comparison to some of our most popular streaming platforms and social media platforms, the difference in how long it took to get that number of usership. Um, Threads has since surpassed ChatGPT in how long it took to get 100 billion viewers probably because it is an outsource of Instagram and it had followers already, uh, but it, it's mega popular and growing um, by the day. So what we decided to do was, because this was a, a presentation about K-12 education, we wanted to get a sense of the landscape of awareness and usership among educators. Um, so we looked across uh, pre-K to 12 and we, found that we had 154 responses just in one school district. So it's not a very large sample size, but most educators in this district know about ChatGBT. They know what it is. Um, about half have explored it, just to see what it's capable of and half have not. Um, more than half, you know, the majority of people have not used ChatGBT for personal tasks or professional tasks. So the usership is not high in this particular sample size. However, the majority of educators who took the survey are interested in learning more about ChatGPT and its capabilities, and perhaps that's why you are here today. Which is a good thing, because what we want to stress is that it can be a tool to use with caution and excitement in school, um, but we want to make sure that the tool and the robot, right, is not controlling the human, that the human is in charge of what the tool uh, can do for our process. And we are putting the teacher at the front and center of our conversation today. And here is a picture of teachers working hard to learn about ChatGPT and AI over the summer to prepare for their work so that we can engage kids in creative, uh, responsible, and ethical use of artificial intelligence in school. So I'm going to transition to talking about ChatGPT as a reading partner a bit. And if we frame reading around a process of meeting making, we know that as we make meaning as readers, we make connections, we ask questions, we clarify information, we go to other sources for information to kind of expand upon ideas. We have wonderings about what we read. Um, and very often, you know, reading sometimes this can, is looked, uh, looked upon as a, a passive and solitary act. 
but we actually can elevate the reading experience and understandings when we interact with other people about our reading to make it more active. So if we think about a time where we really could use a reading partner, um, ChatGPT can be that reading partner for you if you don't have an actual person to have a conversation with. Um, so if we think about the college experience or uh, you know upper grades in high school, reading an abstract right of a research article. How many of you have ever read an abstract for an article that's meant to be very short and concise? But often can feel like a maze to navigate because the purpose of an abstract is to fit important information in a very succinct way, right? But sometimes we need to simplify that because as in the beginning stages of research, we don't always read every single source word for word. We're skimming for information to, to suit the, the purpose of the research. So if you look at my prompt in ChatGPT, for time today, we're going to show you a bunch of examples, but we're not actually on the platform just for time. You're going to see screenshots from ChatGPT in our presentation. Um, so I put in a prompt to simplify this paragraph. That is the abstract from the article from Reading Research Portally about the positive relationship between reading values and reading achievement. And you can just take a look on the screen that the bottom is what ChatGPT gave me. Just a general overview of the article with simplified language uh, to help me gauge what the article is mostly about. So that's a very positive use of ChatGPT when doing research. Another example is when reading fiction. So anybody read Lessons of Chemistry? Okay, so coming out October 13th on Apple TV as a series of Jury Tweet. Um, can we tell life really is to me? Um, so here is a section of Lessons in Chemistry that uh, is about a, a female character who is a scientist and a very strong protagonist. And she includes a lot of language and jargon um, that if you are not a scientist, it's often difficult to navigate. Uh, she had, the writer had scientists as part of her experiences as a writer to make sure that her information was accurate. So here's a, a page from the book where she talks about spinach. And she says, many believe spinach makes us strong because it contains almost as much iron as meat. But the truth is spinach is high in oxalic acid, which inhibits iron absorption. absorption. So when Popeye implies he's getting strong from spinach, don't believe him. So this was particularly interesting for me as a reader making meeting. Uh, one, because there was a time where I had spinach every single day as part of my diet. Um, and I actually had some trouble with nutrients of nutrient absorption. So I wanted to learn more about this fact that she shares. So I went to ChatGPT and I prompted it, uh, simplify the explanation about how oxalates interfere with nutrient absorption. And then it gave me an example. So then, much like happens you know, to me a lot when I'm reading, I go down in front of a rabbit hole. Then I wanted to know, well, if the character is telling me there's negative effects, let's see what ChatGPT says about the negative effects of eating spinach. So it gave me a list of possible negative effects. But it does tell me to consult with a medical professional. Then I, I said, well, if this is not so great for me all the time, what are some alternate choices of eating spinach? And then it gave me a list of other leafy grapes. So kale was of interest to me. And I went on to ask it to give me a recipe that includes kale. So it gave me a kale and chickpea salad with tahini dressing. So ChatGPT could be used for academic tasks, but it also could be used as a partner in discovering new things and in finding recipes that travel itineraries. So there's a lot that you can use um, as a starting point to learn more about what you're interested in. And then the last point I'll make about a reading partner is uh, I prompted it to write a paragraph to explain what happened to Aaron Rodgers during his first game as a New York Jet. So I was reading an article on ESPN, and if the article was maybe not piquing my interest or maybe a little bit complex for me as a reader, I wanted an explanation from another source. But you can see that Rogers showcased his remarkable skill set throwing for over 300 yards and yards and three touchdowns. I might as well say, say, write the dream of every Jets fan, right? <laughs> because that did not happen. Um, he would or played four snaps and then got hurt. So why is this inaccurate? Because it happened just a couple of weeks ago, right after 2021. However, if I change the prompt. And I said, summarize this passage, which I copied and pasted from the ESPN article. 
it is accurate because the language is coming from the article and it's prompted to summarize and not give the original information. Okay. That is. So I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, Mr. Matt Jones, who is an elementary STEM teacher, and he is going to talk to you a little bit about his work uh, with AI and a bearded dragon. So enjoy. Good. And yeah, um, yeah, so I am uh, the elementary STEM teacher. I do pre-K through fifth grade. So the level to which I'm using this in my classroom and how much the kids are using it definitely varies from some of the things that you'll hear uh, as we go through. Um, but as uh, Dr. Adis was alluding to, this doesn't, these things don't have to be scary, right? It doesn't have to be oh, this is going to be in the pits. are never going to learn anything again. They're just going to plug in the prompts and we're, they're never going to figure anything else out. But on the way here, when I left, I was having a conversation with the teacher saying that I was going to Oxford to present about AI and like, oh, you got to tell me about this. Like, I don't know. I don't know if my kids should be using it. Like, are they going to figure things out? Um, and I just, I really like this quote that we suffer more from the imagination and the reality, right? Our, we start thinking all of these things and we imagine that it's going to be this awful outcome. Most of the time, things aren't as bad as you maybe think that they might be, uh, what, you know, your anxiety and uh, whatever else take over. So in my question specifically and through our STEM program, I think of our purpose as, uh, the kids' purpose in elementary school as exploring and skill building, right? There, I got pre-K this year for the first time. There's three-year-olds in my class. They don't know what they're going to do when they grow up, right? I, I want to expose them to as many things as I possibly can. And I want them to get used to a process of problem solving and figuring things out on their own. Because the whole point of STEM and everything that we do, in my room at least, is always like, how do you get like, how do you learn Not What are you learning? We eventually figure things out, but it's more about the conversations and the processes along the way, which lead back to those skills that we're, we're trying to, uh, give to them, right? That we want them to feel comfortable when they come across a problem, whether it's, uh, one that we make up like a STEM challenge, whether it's something that's at the curriculum or whether it's something even in their personal life for their trying to figure out and go through um this process on their own and that's that's all that matters at the end of the day when they leave my room if they're able to uh sort of work their way through those through those steps um so going back to just the general idea of chat gpt right you have to put in these prompts and there's all sorts of now there's prompt engineering jobs and all of these crazy things that are popping up because of uh, this emerging uh, thing that we all are sort of having to figure our way around. Um, and the elements of the prompt are really something that people are very used to, which is the instruction, right? What, what do you want to get out of it? That instruction piece is really uh, to be done on a search engine, right? It's this is the information that I need or the thing that I want to figure out. Tell me what I need to know. When you get the answer back, it's not always exactly what you wanted because the, the, the purpose, the, the real crux of using this to its fullest potential is the context that you include, right? So being able to make those leaps like Dr. Elise was showing uh, through same prompt to prompt, really growing and adding context so that you're getting, uh, you, so that you get what you want out of it. So this is my bearded dragon, Darwin. Uh, I was just joking before that I had to put her in the back of the room now because if she's in the front of the room, the kids all listen to me and they just stare at Darwin the whole time and see what she's eating or what she's climbing on. Um, so I'm going to take you through an example of what I, how I used ChatGPT um, in my classroom. And this whole idea of adding context, right? It served most of our lives uh, in general. 
adding context and having these conversations is just a person to person thing. You need to be able to get your point across to whoever you're speaking to, whether it's another student, a colleague, a spouse, a partner, whoever. Um, but it's not just that anymore, right? It's not just person to person. You also are now seeing that if you can add this skill into your toolbox, that you're able to get a little bit more out of, um, out of these emerging technologies. So the first prompt, and we were talking about, uh, the kids were asking like, what, what is Darwin? So you can go on Google and you can type it in and you would be amazed how many blogs about bearded dragons there are. Um, you'll get all, you'll, you'll get all the lists that you can possibly, uh, possibly think of. They're all exactly the same. It's just one little difference here because this bearded dragon is named this, this bearded dragon is named that, but all the blocks are exactly the same. It's kind of like recipes when you get like their life story, when you search for a recipe, you have to jump to the recipe time. Um, so this is the, the low level prompt, right? You get, what do bearded dragons eat? This is stuff that they eat. Um, and it just gives you a list. I didn't tell it how I wanted the information. I didn't tell it why I needed the information. I didn't give it any other context about what I actually need. It was just, what do the bearded dragons need? So we started talking through, uh, and this was with my fifth graders. We started talking through, like, how could I get something useful out of this that isn't just, oh, now I know I, when I go to stop and shop, I have to pick up collard greens, right? Like, I, I need more from this. So, um, uh, you can see the prompt up here, but basically I was, I spoke to it like I was asking a friend for advice, right? I need help planting a garden. I want to know how I can arrange my garden so that, and we do have a, we do have areas that we can plant at school. So this is something we'll carry through once uh, the spring comes, but I need to know how do I set up what, like, what can I plant here? How do I, how do I figure all of this out? So. You can see it, it gives me, you know, a 10 step plan that gives you everything from testing soil pH to, uh, you know, when to plant different things, when to pull in the plants. And yes, some of this is obviously common sense and things that we probably knew already. Um, but the, the way that you can go from just a simple list to this plan that's drawn out for you. Uh, I think it's the strength, especially for uh, the students that I work with. Um, that's really the strength of this, like being able to show them when you add in that extra context of, oh, I am, I, I, it's not just what is Darwin need to eat. It's I want to know how I can grow things or it to eat. Um, so that leap is sort of the first step. Still, this is sort of abstract, right? So I was, I was talking to them more and I was like, well, we're not planting right away because we have to wait more for the spring. So I needed a meal plan for dog. So I, <clears throat> I asked him for a meal plan, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and I gave it the context of, I want it in a table form. I want to know why I'm feeding the deer to dragon, the things that I'm feeding. And so you can see it goes through. Collard greens provide calcium and fiber. Butternut squash provide these vitamins, right? And I get all of this information. So now I have a better, I have a deeper understanding, not just of what I should do, um, but also why, why I'm doing it. And this can then be sort of sprinkled throughout every unit that we do. We move on to space, or we move on to earth systems. Whatever we're doing, um, adding in this context is going to be a skill that they're going to have to think about because we're not just going to Google it, accept the answer and say, all right, let's go bar. Um, so that's how, that's one of the examples of ways, uh, that I've used it in, uh, my fifth grade, um, classroom, and then going to bring up, uh, so anyways, one of my colleagues dropped a pooch. I said nothing. So, uh, just to give you a little bit of context about me and my role at Long Beach, but in addition to being a high school English teacher, I'm also the extended essay coordinator for our IT diploma program. 
So what that means is that every year I get to assign a 4,000 word research paper to a bunch of very excited users. Um, and they have a 10 month process to completing that research. Um, but over the years, what I've found is that every time there's a new piece of technology that I implement into the extended essay process, people are always, you know, coming back and saying, this process is being made too easy. Moodle tools, it does the work cited for them. And now, you know, databases finds the information. Going. So I'm all ready for the push, you know, pushback I may get as I talk about how I can add chat GPT as another tool. Um, but here I am talking to you mainly as somebody who's, you know, addressing future teachers, perhaps, or researchers, and we're gold. Um, talk to you a little bit about what you should think about doing before you incorporate ChatGPT as a learning tool. Okay. So the first thing is the beginning of every school year, English teachers typically administer baseline assessments because we need to know how our students write, especially when they start to access tools like ChatGPT. Um, and the important thing now is that we store that because in the future, if we have something submitted to us that we think kind of been influenced by a chatbot like ChatGPT, it's good to be able to call the student up and say, here's your writing from September and now you're writing in October, looks a little bit different. Um, so thinking about storing that so we can the care addiction, et cetera. Um, so one of the things I'm planning to do this year with my sophomores is before we engage in a research unit, I'm going to do this activity, which is a consensus board. And this is something a lot of us do in the English department at Long Beach High School, which is we sit them down with a big piece of chart paper and ask the four students to come up with topics they would like to, you know, talk about, write about. And so because we now have a cell phone ban in the classroom, I think that cell phone use in class will probably emerge as a topic of interest. And so, you know, so once we have those topics, one of the ways that ChatGPT can help me to be a more spontaneous educator is that I can pull out my Chromebook and ask the Chromebook, uh, ask ChatGPT that is, to create three argumentative essay prompts about cell phone use in class. So rather than having to come back the next day with those prompts, ChatGPT can generate them for me. So I just have a couple up here that I put a screenshot in of, for example, the impact of cell phone use in classrooms, should cell phones be banned in educational settings, um, you know, and then the idea is that you turn with students then and give them the choice of which prompt interests them the most. So rather than having them replace their thought process, you're giving them an opportunity to evaluate different prompts based on what ChatGPT produces for you. Then I let you give them a time, a chance to write a little bit, some independent writing time in front of you so you can see what they're doing. Um, and while they're writing, I can use ChatGPT Chat to generate models for them. So the reason why I do this is that students love to tear apart writing, but not necessarily their peers' writing. So if it's generated by a computer, they'll have no problem, you know, evaluating it on a thing. Um, so one thing, and this is kind of like, dovetailing off of what Matt was saying is that you have to be very specific because if you ask ChatGPT to produce a four paragraph essay, um, then generally it, it doesn't necessarily know it's going to produce like an introduction, a conclusion. So you have to specify like, I want an introduction, I want two body paragraphs, a conclusion. Um, so when you give students writing that ChatGPT has done, they'll notice right off the bat that some things are missing. For example, you know, ChatGPT doesn't generally pull from sources, books sources. So you have to feed it text that it's going to use or cue it to find source information. But they'll also notice it has things that shouldn't be there. So, you know, introduction labeled with an asterisk, body paragraphs one. So these are all features you might see in a longer research paper. Um, you're not going to see them in a four paragraph essay. So they'll, they have the opportunity to evaluate that and then compare and contrast their own writing with it. So I didn't have to write that model essay. Chap GPT produced it for me in just a couple of, it's not even a couple of minutes. So for my concern, especially as an educator, and I know um, Dr. Reedy spoke about this, is how do you help students maintain their academic integrity when now there is this thing that will produce a research game for them? So, you know, you have to think about students as not being people who want the computer to do work for them, but who in moments of desperation or they're bored with the task and they're stressed, you know, or they don't even know how to cite information that ChatGPT produces, they're going to turn to that chatbot and let it do the work for them at 11.58 when something's due at 11.59. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you people understand that. Yeah. Um, so the way that you can do this is that you assign more tasks that involve student choice, that so they're interested in what they're writing about. 
Um, the most important thing is to devote class time to each stage of the writing process and to use AI as your teaching assistant and their research assistant. So what this is meant for us in, at Long Beach High School and, you know, as part of the International Baccalaureate program, we have flexibility as opposed to an AP program, is that we've pulled back on literature to allow more time to write in. And so, for example, in my 11th grade class, I only cover three full in a whole school year. But they do a lot of writing, a lot of collaborative work, and they grow as, as prior speakers as a result. So when we do a research project, there are definitely a couple of weeks in there at least. And this is for the college level English class. So at 10th graders, I might give them three weeks to do a research project. And this is a good tip for you, especially if your college professor is handing you an assignment saying, come back for research paper. You need to go through all of these different things. You can't just produce it in a night. You need to have a proposal, source list. Uh, so all the things I have up here. So what we do, especially if I have 10 months to do this, is everything is submitted to Turnitin.com. And, you know, that's something, I don't know if you played around with this, any of you, but Turnitin.com is pretty good at detecting AI use. So if, if most steps go into Turnitin.com, you catch it, but you also see where students are struggling and you're able to help them with that. So just especially for those of you engaged in research, um, you know, you may have encountered these problems in the past that you don't have a word or research question exactly, um, you know, and evaluating the kind of research questions it comes up with, that does take grip of think tank. But something that's a tip for me to you is that Gravity will tell you how to cite chat chat, chat thought generated information that you're used to using. So if I ask it to create a research question, um, generally it'll go over for it if I just ask it that general question. So here they want the student to think about strategic thinking, cultural identity, and empowerment in a research paper. That's a bit much. So there's an opportunity to regenerate, to narrow the research question down to what interests you. And then once you've determined what it is that you want to write about, it will generate a suggested reading list for you. But as Dr. Redis mentioned, it only will go back to the 2021 of earlier. So it's good for book sources. However, it is not reliable for all night sources. So I just experienced this last week with a student researching Michael Jackson's influence on current dancers. Every single website it suggested with links, everyone came up as page not found because they're all from 2021 and earlier. So keep that in mind. If it's 1158, because the links it's going to give you to online sources are not going to work generally. I mean, you can work with a librarian to help you find sources like that. And then finally, one of the highest level um, tasks that we give students, you know, especially with 10 month paper, is that they're, you know, with historians, they have to look at competing historians' views. And so it's not always easy to figure out what the different sides of historical debate will be. So this is something I'll be urging my historians to look at is how can you use ChatGPT to determine how, uh, you know, what kinds of competing views are out there about something they're researching. So you see an example about the Civil War here. Um, and then again, it will be a suggested reading list. Which <laughs> So the last thing, future teachers, is that, you know, if you have a class of 27 students writing a paper in front of you, the hands are always up. What do I put in my conclusion? Well, how do I write a body paragraph topic sentence? So ChatGPT will give them pretty good tips about writing. And so there's something else I'm thinking about, maybe, you know, setting up a station in my classroom this year to uh, help them ask the questions rather than me bouncing around and answering them myself. So basically, I'm just saying, if, if you're using ChatGPT with a foot, they're monitoring them. There is very little chance, I think, that they'll misuse ChatGPT, and it might make the whole process a little bit easier for you down the road. Big so, um, And next, I think we have Ms. Turkestein, right? Doing the teacher toolbox. Did I get that right? Good luck. Okay. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Tersey, Long Beach Public Schools Director of Sundance. And I'm going to speak with you about ways that you can use ChatGPT um, to help your repertoire of resources in your lesson planning and design. Um, I have to admit that I was slow to jump on the artificial intelligence bandwagon. <laughs> um, but for me, as a, <clears throat> excuse me, as a director crew in Long Beach, we really were, um, we realized it was hot top. Teachers were coming to us, um, you know, from different departments at all different level, levels and, you know, looking for support and how we can, um, you know, be aware of student use and monitor it. 
Um, and we talked about having a parent and how we, for our secondary parents, and we both go in the high school as like a cautionary and informative way to move forward in the screen world with artificial intelligence as educators. Um, one of the first things that I did was with Matt Jones at Zoom service and looked at how I can make a slide deck. Because when I think about myself back in my early days of teaching, um, what am I presenting? What is my lesson plan going to teach this stuff? And if I'm a brand new teacher right out of school, I have nothing. I have no repertoire. So one of the first things that I did was I put myself back in the day um, when I was invited to do a demo lesson straight out of Brown school. And, um, you know, I made it to the second round and now I'm asked to do um, a demonstration lesson in a high school physics classroom, which was where my experience um, lied. And then I chose to show you today some samples from what was generated from putting in um, Newton's second law. And as my colleagues had explained before, one of the things that you really have to be careful of are the tips from ChatGPT as far as how to ask the questions, what's coming up in the response, and to check the facts. I chose things for myself as I worked through a few different in-service classes of what I knew. So I wouldn't necessarily know if information about spinach and nutrient absorption was true because I was a physics person, not a bio person. So in my um, libraries in these classes, I checked conservation of momentum and different things that it was giving me to check my facts and use my expertise. Um, once you get into the responses that are generated by the robot, the uh, most of our things that I found was to be as specific as possible. So um, just like some of the other presenters showed, they literally copy and pasted exactly what you wanted to um, learn more about. So the way that you input your response, the way that you input completely controls the output. My very first attempt to at this, I had generally said, create a lesson plan on Newton's second law. Mm -hmm. And it was very broad. Um, I didn't like what it gave me. So then I tried to reprompt it and I went directly to the Wonder of Science website. So if you leave out there are science ed majors. Um, the Wonder of Science is definitely somewhere that you should go. And I copy and pasted what Paul Anderson, you know, had on his site, which is straight from the New York State Science Learning Standards. But I added my own piece because we know from the new New York State Standards um, that science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts must be included. When I'm going to formally observe a teacher, I give them a template, um, you know, that's three-dimensional that has practices, concepts, content. And I knew I wanted to see science and engineering practices and cross study concepts. So I added that piece myself to guide the robot's um, output to me, the robot. <laughs> um, and then you modify the specifics. So this is not a passive exercise. This is definitely something where like the human brain is 100% necessary. So I'm not just taking what the artificial intelligence is generating and being like, okay, great. This is my lesson plan. Here you go. I need to make sure that everything is as accurate and precise as possible. So this is even, I would take this one step further and you know, this is saying high school, um, grades nine through 12, I would specify that 11th grade, New York state, regions level, whatever the case may be. And I found that as I played around with the inputs, it gave me, um, a more and more precise output. The one thing that I found interesting, and again, I chose something that I knew that I could check myself. I put in, um, as I was playing around, some a lesson on conservation of momentum. And, and I, so, I said 40 minutes. I want a 40 minute lesson plan on conservation of momentum. It literally gave me a unit plan for like a week. I just said, no, 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 no. I then tried to be polite. Please make this uh, more appropriate for 40 minutes in the last. So you definitely need to use your brain. Um, the answers that it gives, sometimes it gives you some of the um, story, but doesn't give you the whole thing. So again, this is about the human using the tool, not the tool using the human. Some of the science and engineering practices and cross-cutting concepts are listed, but there's others. So I'm thinking it's, it's really giving me a place to begin. It's not giving me my final product. So I'm looking at the practices listed and I'm saying, okay, can I do more with this lesson in, in addition to asking questions and engaging in argument what else can I do? But it was good for those of you who are just starting. It gives you every lesson element that you're going to learn in school should be there. The five E's, the objective, the closure, and the extension for students to finish early. It was all there. Um, but again, you can't just take it and, and run. 
I um, wanted to see what it would give me as far as phenomenon, because in science, um, you know, starting with the anchoring phenomenon, uh, inquiry-based, student-centered activity, I gave it a broad stroke, and it didn't give me an incorrect answer, because phenomenon is defined as any, you know, observable event in the natural world. It's not wrong that a heart being pushed could exemplify the second law, but is that really engaging? If I went in front of a group of 16 year olds and pushed a cart, I don't think they would be too loud. So I prompted it further. Um, I would like a more novel strap on. Give me something that's going to be more engaging. And then it gave me something for a water powered rocket, which I thought was much cooler. <laughs> don't know if I do it in a demo, but you know, it was definitely cool. Um, so I love the image of Princess Leia. Um, help me, Obi Wan Kenobi, your mind. I'm the hope. Because it is the sort of, it feels silly to say it, but you are having a two-way conversation with a robot, with this artificial intelligence, and you're helping it to give you exactly what you want. So by regenerating and sending messages, um, it does refine. And um, like I said before, it doesn't give you the wrong answers, but it just doesn't always give you the whole picture. Um, earlier, Matt showed a diagram or a slide with um, answers in table format. So there's different ways that you can get responses. Um, it doesn't always have to give an answer in paragraph form. Um, so this is just an example of if you're doing a data collection or an experiment, you can ask it to generate a table. But again, I don't know that I would put all of these quantities in a table. So you have to think what variables are you um, measuring? Do I want to put something else constant in a table and, you know, just always fast checking as you go along. This concept map on prompting guide actually came from Dr. Radice's um, in service over the summer. And this was a fun activity that we did by just thinking about thinking about output. And it's interesting because throughout this whole experience of <laughs> learning more about how to use AI, it actually helps me communicate in real life with my person-to-person -person interactions because it's helping me use the most specific language that I can. So it's not just about like interacting with, an, with a machine, but it's thinking about how do I want to get my point across in the most succinct way and, and be specific and be, you know, a very um, precise and um, pointed in my, in my thoughts. And so going through this helps me think about the answer before I ask the question. And as a science person, I always love how the answers lead to more questions. Like Thorian was showing us before, we go down this like rabbit hole, we get one answer, and then um, that leads us to dive further. And there's a ton of like snapshot things that uh, I didn't show you, but that there are you know discussion questions that you can ask the intelligence generate for you. Assessment questions, it gets answers. I was actually impressed when I asked it for five assessment questions on Newton's sex law. I did not specify the structure of the format, but it gave me like a sampling of multiple choice and short answer and calculation, and it was right. I ended up checking it. <laughs> um, so asking for you know different prompts, answers in table format, setting limits like age groups. Are we dealing with pre-K, fifth grade, high school? Um, simplifying text. One of my favorite ones on this sheet is role play from a specific lens. And I love that one because as an administrator in a pre-K through 12 on um, role, do we sometimes have these really, you know, big ideas that we think are great. And so when we're sitting in our little director suite and we're talking about, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could eliminate homework or let's get rid of honors classes forever. And we're like, yeah. And then I think, well, what if, what if my teachers in high school think if I went in there and said, we're not going to do this anymore, we're going to go with plan B. So I can ask chat GPT to give me the counter argument. And it, um, it cares me for what somebody might say who's not in favor of what I think. So um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Some fun, engaging ways to interact with kids. Texting in the style of a famous professional. Um, you know, explain Simon diagrams in the voice of Richard Feinbe um, is actually pretty spun on. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Dr. Kellyman from West Wesla. Summer. Good afternoon. I drew the short straw. I get to talk about legal and ethical concerns. I don't get Taylor Swift. I don't get a myriad dragon, uh, but just come along for the ride. Um, one of the um, paramount 
tasks that uh, that I'm charged with as a director of technology. It's making sure that we're checking all the boxes uh, from a legal standpoint when we bring in an app or bring in a new piece of software. And Edlaw TD is a really important part of that. Um, so when we're talking about large language models, which is something that ChatGPT is, that BARD is, um, that might sound kind of foreign to you. So asking it for context, I said, you know, please explain what a large language model is, but explain it to a third grade. Yes. And these are some of the uh, responses. The one in the, with the darker background is from ChatGPT. The one with the white background is from BARD. And Garrett started off by talking about a big bag of Legos. And I love Legos. So I got immediately behind this bottom. And I'm like, all right, let, let it keep going. And then it just starts kind of rambling. And you read through it, you'll see that it loses focus and it loses the metaphor. And sometimes you'll notice that both of these platforms will do that. And we have, I have a great illustration of that in a few moments. Um, but regardless of the question, regardless of the prompt that you give it, everything that it's generating for you is probability based. It's thinking about if all of the millions and trillions of words that we've seen, which ones go together and which ones make sense next. So if you ask a question about a school and you're talking about a boat, it'll start thinking school to fish. If you ask it a question about a school and you're talking about third graders, you're going to get a very different type of response. So when we bring one of these things into school, we have to make sure that we are preparing to deal with any of those legal concerns that Edlaw 2 d um, kind of requires us to consider. So we need to think to ourselves, what information is being provided by the students? ChatGPT is a really straightforward platform. It's just a little box that you type into and then another box where answers come up. But when the students can put anything into there, we have to be concerned. Are they putting personal information into there? Are they asking questions about their address? And what's going to happen with that information when ChatGPT gets it? They're constantly trying to refine these, so we're not quite sure how long they're keeping information and what they plan on doing with it. We also don't know if they're going to be good guardians of our student data that gets put into there. Um, and it's not just the prompt that goes in, but any of these websites can also collect information about where your IP address is from. So now we're putting this information that the students are giving and adding in the student is coming from one beach area for from West Islip area. And we're armed to use either of these. You're also signing in with a profile. So what other information is linked to that profile when you're, you know, interacting with the AI, uh, whether it's your social media information, or just, you know, some basic information that you use to sign up. Uh, and one of the good pieces of advice that was given to me, um, and it also showed up in the Netflix documentary, The Social Dilemma, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So trying to figure out if this is free and it costs them millions of dollars to have this go in every day, how are they keeping it free? What are they doing with the data that they're collecting? Are they selling it to anybody? Just something that came to the back of your head. So along with that, uh, one of my tech director friends asked uh, ChatGPT if it would sign a data, uh, data privacy agreement. Uh, ChatGPT refused. It said that it's not capable of it. So I guess we're happy that the robots haven't made it that far yet. Um, but there is talk of an enterprise level coming out and that enterprise level uh, will sign uh, data privacy agreements. So that might allow it to come to schools a little bit more readily. And ChatGPT4 uh, is going to create citations. And that comes to her at a cost. One of the things that we should consider uh, while we interact with these is the concept of constitutional AI. So if you think about how this works and how this is set up, and it might even sound like scary and large, and kind of unknowable, but this is just a computer progress. It has no sense of the world when it's created. It gets any of that from the rules that are put into place when it's developed and when it's designed. So constitutional AI is a way of training AI to follow a set of principles. It's almost like 
giving AI a conscience, but it's not really a conscience. It's just, these are the rules, these are the limitations that you must exist within. So, um, one company uh, that I'll talk about has kind of fed their AI, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the Terms and Service Agreements from a bunch of very popular programs, uh, and some other kind of guiding principles. And what they wanted to look at is finding this balance between harmlessness and helplessness. If you feed the chat GPT, all of the information that was on the internet before 2021, that comes with good information and it comes with scary information. You know, we've seen some of the insightful language that can be on Twitter and that can be on the internet. And without any discerning rules for it, ChatGPT learns those. And what you want to do is make sure that you're putting things into place that protects the user from seeing those, or from ChatGPT, from giving you a recipe for a bearded dragon that might have inflammatory words in it. So trying to figure out how you can balance See. helplessness where it says, I can't help you with that because it's too restrictive of rules mm -hmm. and harmlessness where it's too permissive and anything could come out of it. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that they go about this is a pretty fascinating concept called bot loop training, which is actually two AIs conversing with each other. And one is the learn it. So let's just say that that's chat GBT in this example. And the other one is the supervisor. And the supervisor has these rules. And the supervisor says, this answer is a good answer. This answer is a bad answer. Can the good, bad, it's completely up to whatever the program is trying to train. And over the course of thousands of interactions, it hones and the first one, the, the uh, learner, figures out what is an expected response and what is an unexpected response. Uh, and with this, let's think about training our students are we teaching students about these limitations? Are we talking about all the processes that went on behind the scenes before ChatGPT made it to them? And do we talk about how these processes might create a bias? Who's choosing how we're training them? Who's figuring out which guiding principles we want to get to this AI or that AI? Which ones are we leaving out? So sometimes we, you know, we need to talk about you know, the learning about learning. So Anthropic, this is the company that's focusing on constitutional AI right now. And Dario Flodai, who is the, uh, the founder of this, uh, he was actually part of the ChatGPT development team before he created his own. And I just bolded a few spots from a quote uh, that he recently provided in an interview. Um, but one of his concerns is about how AI is used. His concern is much more than just plagiarisms. But if you have access to all of the information that's on the internet and you can give it context and ask for things what's to stop somebody from saying how do i create a bum and having something in place that says i can't help you with that is important you know we don't want our students to find out how to make a stink bomb to throw off in the in the stairway or we don't want bad actors learning how to do even scarier things at a larger scale So switching out to some good news, uh, talking about uh, some apps that are using AI already besides ChatGPT, we have the EdTech Genome Project. It's a massive collection of constituents. It includes AFT, ISD, the National Board of Professional Teaching Standards, NEA, NWA, Scholastic, Clever, HMH, uh, as well as some school districts. I lost on that one. I'm sorry. That was a big list. <laughs> Baltimore County Public Schools, Chicago Public Schools, Dallas Independent School District, and the Harvard Grad School of Education, uh, in addition to dozens of others. And what they're trying to do is find out more than just through asking one company, how do you benefit students? What it's looking at is not just big data, huge data, from all of these programs coming together and looking for what's the most synergistic way of these interacting with each other? Is it a combination of Scholastic here with this demographic and this program using Clever? And all of these things working together in the most statistical analysis of ways to figure out what has the most effect on student learning. 
So they've been working on this since about, I think it's 2019, and they're hoping to have all of their initial um, results published in 2023, which is really exciting. Uh, we have AI in some of the apps that we already use, like Google Workspace. Uh, when you're drafting an email, if your Google tries to suggest what the next few words are, it's not programmed to say these three words should show up after this word. What it's doing is it's looking at the context of your sentence and saying, with all of these words that came before it, these are likely words that would come next. So again, it's all probability based. And you might even notice that sometimes because you sent an email to Lorraine and Christy that it might suggest Matt Jones and Tony next because it knows that I've been scheduling meetings with them or working on a presentation with them. And between Google Calendar, Gmail, and uh, slides, it's all connected. Uh, YouTube is also made for recommendations based on video content of yours, as well as other things that are showing up in your drive. So if it knows that you've been working on this, it might recommend videos related to that. Um, you'll also notice when the uh, agreement to connect your Google Drive with this comes up, uh, this in FARG specifically, uh, it says, you know, share parts of your conversation and other relevant info. Um, this is not covered by EdLaw2D. So if you have an EdLaw2D agreement between your school district and Google, this is outside of that. So just a little cautionary tale there. Um, Canva, which blew up over the last two years, has a new feature called text to image. So one of my favorite parts, and the reins obviously is a big uh, lit nerd, so I wanted to keep it relevant for her. Uh, but one of my favorite parts about reading is imagining the people, the settings, the world that's created by the words and coming up with my own vision of that. And if I said to you, picture Harry Potter, how many of you immediately, we'll do a quick show of hands, how many of you immediately came up with Daniel Radcliffe? Kate, so did Campbell. In only giving it the two words, I get Daniel Radcliffe-esque images. But what I could do instead is actually take J.K. Rowling's words and give that and see what images came up there. And I don't get Daniel Radcliffe anymore. I get a different character, something independent of the movies. So it's kind of fun that we could take chunks of text and put them in there and ask the AI to come up with images and help our students imagine these worlds in different ways than just that one version that some director came up with. Um, a little something about me. Last month I turned 40, culture plus. It's the fun. And like most 40 year olds do, um, they go out for a drink with their spouse, then they end up at a tattoo parlor. Now, my spouse has had the idea for his tattoo for as long as I know him. At least 16 years, he knew he wanted to have this skylight of New York City around his leg. All these ideas. I'm not that committed. I've had different ideas. They've lasted about a week and then I've moved on. But as a tech directors do when they're sitting in a tattoo parlor after having a few drinks, I went on Canva and started looking for some inspiration. I'm a big scuba diver. I'm a huge Lego fan. Like I said before in that other example, when Bart started talking about Legos, I was all in. And... I gave Canva a prompt. A vibrant seascape of coral reef made out of Lego with a shipwreck. I love, I love wreck diving. And a Lego scuba diver swimming horizontally. And this was its creation. I wasn't totally sold. I wasn't getting this tattooed on my leg anytime soon. I was going to say, show it for light. And we're not there yet. No, they didn't put them. So, <laughs> I didn't even click. You got bird. That was a suspense. Um, it's good. Not great. Definitely not tattoo worthy. Yeah. So instead, I went to Dolly, which is actually the image side of ChatGPT, and I gave it the same prompt: a CCA scheme, a fiber coral leaf made of uh, coral reef made of Lego, Lego scuba diver swimming horizontally, rocks, fish. I don't want to write coral. I write coral. We'll see how that plays out in the fourth picture. The buddy. And this is what came out. Yeah. Now. 
you might focus on the coal because I pointed that one out in the uh, the last picture, but you didn't notice that the man has three R's. <laughs> this is one of the limitations of all of these image generating ones is that sometimes they don't necessarily use the logic of the world that we live in. So you might have a person with one eye. You might have a person with three. Um, and in this case, you have a leg of creation with three R's. Uh, that's apparently me swimming at a, yep. uh, at a coal mine. Uh, another app that's pretty popular, Duolingo for language learning. Uh, so the biggest link that's come in at uh, from this AI growth in Duolingo is their ability to do uh, a chatbot. So the days of just listening to a cassette and repeating back the phrases that you hear, it's no more. Now it's you're learning a language and you're interacting with a chatbot that's going to give you real feedback. And based on your answers, the chatbot will respond in kind. So it can be a very dynamic conversation, nothing static like we're used to. Around the front of you learning, which focuses on mathematics, is now using um, adaptive and interactive video spell. So based on how you're progressing through the lessons, the videos that you see can be different. The videos can also uh, be changed a little bit. Um, and it also has responsive gameplay. So based on how students are doing as they're progressing, the gameplay changes to meet what they're doing. And the phrase that they use is hyper-personalized. So every student in the class could have a completely different experience. Uh, Classcraft is a gamification platform that focuses on social le learning and behavior. And what they've been doing is using AI, connecting it with early intervention data and student interactions with the platform to try to come up with warnings for administrators and for teachers about when students are struck emotionally and to identify those students before the traditional round table where teachers would talk about, you know, the students that they have and say, oh, did you notice Johnny's struggling and somebody else says, no, not in my class. But what this can actually do is take big sets of data and try to identify those students sooner. Uh, and then we have Adobe Firefly. This is another image based on. It's also very fun to play with if you have an Adobe license. It has three components. Uh, it has text to image, which is like Canva and Dolly. It has generative fill, which is the one showing right now. You can remove parts of a picture and then provide input what you want to see there, which could be really fun and create a creative outlet for students. And then that last one was tech, text effects, you know, developing new thoughts where I take the text and giving them a, a texture um, that matches what you're looking for. And it's, I am, but through all of this, it's just the beginning that we need to prepare for what's ahead. These are changing every day. I'm constantly getting new messages from some of our software vendors about new AI integrations that's showing up in their programs. And it's exciting. It's fun. I like going to work every day and seeing that there's something different for me. Um, that's why I did become an art science teacher. I don't know if I rocked and changed that much, uh, but it's kind of like that they on change every day and um, keep things fresh. So thank you very much. And Dr. Adis, close. With that being said, we um, the entire presentation could just be relevant in about three weeks. So I am like it. We are going to transition to uh, our panel. So um, our teams are up on. If you have any questions about anything that you saw during the presentation that you would like any one of us to elaborate on, uh, we are happy to engage in conversation about what we share. As if you do have a question, um, just please come up and uh, speak into the microphone so that uh, those who are watching via live stream are able to hear uh, nicely. Okay.
questions? I can get back with that with Wacy. All right. Yeah, that thing that's good. Mind me. Thanks, Chase. You can get blind. Yes. But with the other readings. Okay. Or do we give extra credit if they ask a question? Great. The nine witness shards. For me, too. They in act. If there are no questions, do you want us to wrap up, or unless you have questions, you're a teller. We want to discuss spouse. You think the spouse? Is there anything that we want to discuss further? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So if you could say a little bit more, great presentation by, by everyone, but how the approach in the classroom is adapted for the grade level of the students, because you're covering three-year-olds through the 12th grade. And so any, any guidance there? And maybe the follow-up question is, how, how are you managing through the parent and family responses to say, say I'd... Start. Okay, so I can talk a little bit about high school. Um, so for one thing, um, in Long Beach, students are not able to sign up for ChatGPT with their school accounts. So throughout the last couple of weeks, knowing I was coming here, I asked students randomly, like show of hands, are ready to use ChatGPT for anything? You know, like but very few students have utilized at least not in a way that they want to admit to at this point. So I've had to think about if I am going to implement it in the classroom, how am I going to do this? Because my students, I, I can't say, you know, use your private email for a school assignment. So in my case, I briefly alluded to the idea of having like stations where if they're going to be accessing ChatGPT to generate a prompt, or find research sources that, you know, they'll come up, use my Chromebook, my account, um, under my supervision. So that's one thing is that I think it's really important that teachers supervise the process. For the long-term research project that I spoke about, all of the students are matched with faculty supervisors who will also be observing them one-on-one -on -one using ChatGPT. Um, but the main thing for me is, is that it's not a secret that I use turnitin.com, as I mentioned, so I model for students, this is how, you know, if, if I submit something generated by ChatGPT to turnin.com, here is how it identifies, like this was likely generated through a chatbot. Um, I haven't heard a thing for parents. <laughs> so we had to meet the teacher night. None of them seem particularly concerned about ChatGPT at this point, and they might have more concerns after they have, um, what is the, the parent, like a parent, you know, informational session that's coming up. Um, but I think it's just so new that for me, the main thing is that the parents know that it's being supervised if it's used, that if a student is suspected of having used ChatGPT to generate a response that I have evidence of their writing to put side by side with what I'm suspecting was created by chat, chat, you know, chatbot um, that thread in may have identified so that they don't feel like I'm trying to play like a, a gotcha. Yeah. Um, and also to acknowledge that some students can write like a chatbot or better than a chatbot. So you really need to have those those samples. But so far, no, I haven't gotten one of us about chat GPT yet. So, so yeah, so for high school, I think especially it's important under supervision um, and just, you know, show them how you can use it in a way that's productive. One of the things that we considered when we were uh, planning together, if you notice, um, after the introductory piece, Matt spoke about his experience as an elementary teacher, and then Tony followed with her experience as a high school teacher. Um, like with any good practice, modeling for students, no matter the age, is always helpful. Um, so if you have your smart board or your screen up, you know, teachers are demonstrating how to use AI, um, again, creatively, effectively, and appropriately. Um, but, you know, Matt described, I think, a shared experience where he was typing into um, the AI to get the information about the bearded dragon. And then just kind of organically in Tony's presentation, she mentioned how, the, you know, the students were the ones using ChatGPT um, on their extended essay or with that argument topic. Um, so we were thinking about that in, in the scope of our presentation about how Maybe in elementary school, um, it's a bit more controlled and demonstrative. And then as we go into middle and high school, 
students would start to use the tool a bit more independently. Um, and then, you know, parents and caregivers are really important stakeholders, right, to a child's educational experience. And although we, you know, do not feel like experts at all with AI, um, our administrative team is having an informative um, and uh, an informative night about ChatGPT and AI uh, in Long Beach in a few weeks. And the purpose that we're going to make very clear is to raise awareness, just like any other issue, right, that comes into our schools, cyberbullying, nutrition, things that are circulating and orbiting students' lives, we want to engage parents in the conversation. Um, so we are going to do a presentation kind of similar to what we shared with you today and just actually demonstrate what ChatGPT might look like in an English class, in a math class, in a social studies class, in a science class, so that um, when parents are engaging with kids at home, they, they are on the lookout for you know what to look for. Um, but we are not going to talk about policy um, because it's too new. Uh, you know, Patrick, you know, has a really good perspective about that. You know, to, to create any policy at this point might be a bit uh, premature. I think um, another thought that popped into my head when thinking about using a house that's going to influence the work in the classroom could completely change the way that we're assessing and collecting, you know, information about what kids know and how they know it. So if we're realistic that with these tools like ChatGPT and other um, artificial intelligence assistance exists, maybe the way that we, you know, test kids or assign homework is going to be more of a communication skill and a conversation as opposed to somebody coming in with an essay or a derivation from for a math class, because that can all be generated at home. Um, and, you know, from a parent perspective, I have two teenagers at home and, you know, under parent supervision, I think is huge. And one of my daughters asked me a question that I wasn't sure of. So I said, well, let's just see. And we'll see what chat GPT says. And I looked at it and worked, you know, with her. And I said, well, what do you think it told me? You know, and then it was, it was like a supervised activity. Um, but nothing that, um, you know, the kids want to just use on their own. I think it's going to change the way that people do um, handle assignments for sure. And when Christy was presenting earlier, you know, she talked about how she was fact checking ChatGPT to look for accurate information. And I've actually seen some teachers assigning that as the assignment. So not as much find this information out, but it's this is what the AI came up with. Tell me if it's right or wrong well, through that. You know, finding sources that either refute it or substantiate what ChatGPT came up with. So you're simultaneously showing the limitations and the flaws of the AI to the students, but putting the power in their hands to actually do a little bit of research beyond what ChatGPT gave back. Hi, I have the question. Um, special ed students are often mainstreamed now into regular classes. And how would AI help them? Are there things that would help the students um, help them learn? Somebody, for instance, with Down syndromes or a physical disability or both? I'd want So. Uh, in a past life, I was a ICT teacher, a co-teacher, um, been a special ed teacher in the rain. And, you know, quickly learned that when students are able to research their passions uh, or learn through their passions, they were much more successful. So this could very easily be used to provide examples related to that student's passion that you might not find in a normal textbook or on a normal educational website. So if you have a student who absolutely loves everything about trains, and then you decide you want to use trains as the mechanism to teach a science topic, a math topic, a literary topic, you know, that could actually generate those responses for you. And you could reach that most student. It also could be used as a tool for scaffolding information. Um, so, you know, we had a portion about lesson planning, looking at the portion of the lesson, but when we think about uh, differentiating for students' needs as learners, uh, teachers can use it to, as an approach to instruction. 
uh, to get source material at different levels of complexity, um, various examples of whatever the lesson is compiled of. So that would be uh, what I call like the off-stage moment of preparing, you know, to meet the needs of various learners. And then the on-stage moment when teachers are working with students, um, the students can use it as a tool to scaffold their process as well uh, in similar ways to, you know, what we shared at the presentation to be a partner for reading, for writing, and for research, all depending upon what the needs of the student are and, you know, of course, their interests. It's interesting if you look at um, software like Newzella or other literary um, websites and you can change the Lexile level or ask for different levels of difficulty and you can give it a specific grant, um, brand uh, or range of like, you know, Lexile 300 to 500 or whatever the score may be or um, Google Translate into a different language. There, the amount of sources that it will reference to give different um, like learning to different scaffolds and different levels is so vast that I feel like that would be um, just a, a really good tool for students that have um, various needs. I remember teaching physics with the right hand rule and somebody came up with a way for students to do the right hand rule in magnetism without actually using their hand. So, um, you know, I'd be curious to see what, what AI would come up with now 22 years later. <laughs> I also think part of it is like the, the scaffolding and the changing reading levels and things like that are, are great, but also I, in my in-service class, like I gave other teachers a lot of tools to figure out how to save time using AI, but it's also like what the teachers are able to do other things because they're not spending time on like the busy work of just changing the level of right. Like it's there. So what do you do now? Like no. No teacher is just doing that and then putting their feet up. Now they have this extra time at living that that's like an exciting part of everything too, is like, what can we do with the extra time that we're gaining from, uh, you know, these, the stress of these tools. Yeah. And I would add that, um, last year, for example, I was paired up with an, um, an ELL teacher and I'd say more than half of our students were students who were English language learners and some of them had scored very well on a nice flat and they were you know placed in a class where you know for some of them they had their rocky days and their good days um but we were maintaining the same level of text complexity because it was a regular English class so in an assignment where for example students are each given a poem to analyze and you don't want to have any students sing about if you could feed that poem into ChatGPT, ask it questions about literary features, simplify the language, et cetera. You don't necessarily have anybody, you know, particularly raising hands, drawing attention to themselves. Everybody feels like what class, if you're able to have that station, a student could go to a teacher using a Chromebook, the ChatGPT. So everybody's, everybody's needs are met in different ways and it could be spontaneous. It doesn't have to be something that's planned ahead of time. It can be happening right there in the classroom at that loft. Hey, almost out, right? This is How would you suggest pre-service teachers incorporate chat GBT? Because one of the questions that we'll typically ask on an interview is one of them is going to be technology, others for management keeping the students engaged. So for our pre-service teachers in here, what should I do as a professor? What should I ask my staff to do as well? But more and more the pre-service teachers that for our audience. Thank I think um, practice is the best thing for anybody to do when they're learning a new craft. So um, one of the things that I found to be really interesting um, was you know asking for a lesson plan or asking for a slide presentation but see what see what comes up and so in that lesson plan if they actually say okay your your opening um you know your introduction is five minutes your engagement for your exploration is 10 minutes or 15 minutes actually do it don't just read it and say yeah, okay okay like actually be like be in the moment and and practice and it's kind of like i keep going back to physics problems but you know, I can't learn physics by watching the teacher work out the solution. I need to put my pencil to the paper and I have to work out the solution myself. So I think to take whatever the artificial intelligence generates and then have your pre service teachers actually do the demo lesson in the class. Here's the lesson that, um, you know, the AI generated. 
here's the way that I revised it. I actually went down my own rabbit hole and on you know, on, you know Google Doc, you can comment on paper. I started commenting on the artificial intelligence and I felt like that was a little strange, but it was interesting because no, here's a comment I would make about this. Here's how I would change that. So maybe as you know, on, on, on class activity with the pre-service teachers, I would have you actually deliver the lesson that the artificial intelligence generated and then do a lesson study, you know, have each other, what were the glows, what were the grows, do you know, what were the things that um, worked well and what could you do better? Because that's what you do in teaching every day. Um, at the end of the day, you're going to sit down and say, this was awesome. And you want to write that down really quickly so that you don't forget. And then you could teach that same lesson, you know, three periods later and it could be a complete fail. And that process of reflection is one of, you know, the most valuable things that you can do as a teacher. Um, because it, you, it won't always work the first time. So practice everything, um, that, that you come across would be the advice that I would get. I think it's really important to know your craft, right? And to, you learn your craft and you know your craft by going to school, right? Talking with other teachers, reading, observing teachers, gaining experience. Um, because the, the knowledge and the experience that you gain with practice, like Christy is, is sharing, is going to help you to interpret um, what you may or may not ask artificial intelligence to help you do. So, for example, um, if I put in into ChatGPT to create a rubric for a sixth grade argument writing piece, an argument essay, it will do it. It will give it to you as a table. It's a great tool to use, a great starting point. But I'm only able to interpret and analyze that we're breaking this good for my kids because I have studied my craft, right? I read the work of teacher researchers. I've practiced it in the classroom. Um, so I think, you know, the, your experience in school, in the classroom, um, to gain your knowledge is so important. And you bring that to the tool, um, kind of what a beam of our presentation is. Um, and then also, you know, you mentioned an interview um, at question, interview questions. I think that it's, it would be who you to have um, some thoughts to share about AI. You know, at S level, you might be asked a question on an interview of what's your position, what do you know about, what's your perspective, and coming to things like this could be really helpful. Practicing with it is really helpful. Talking to other people, it could be to a cooperating teacher or you know, colleagues in a school, um, and to show while you may not be certain what your position is on a die, at least on an interview, you can give some talking points that you've been thinking about it because it definitely is something that is relevant in education. And you would want to demonstrate to the committee that you're thinking about how technology and new tools impact the way that learners at various ages learn, um, and will be, um, developing their literacies, um, in and outside of school. And New York State is in the process of rolling out the computer science and digital fluency standards, which if you're not familiar with them, it's pretty much, they pretty much say every student kindergarten through 12th grade is a computer scientist at some level. And it's a grade level of full free standards, they grow over time, but not only are students expected to understand, you know, digital literacy, but they're also supposed to understand to some extent, you know, computer networking and cybersecurity by the time they hit 12th grade. And I think that especially next year, which is when all school districts are supposed to be led to miss, you know, K-12, that you teachers are going to be hearing these questions going into, um, into interviews. And, you know, you might be going for a ninth, you know, ninth grade ELA position, but being asked a question about the computer science and digital facilities like standards and thinking about the role that AI has in your classroom specifically could provide you that answer to that interview question. You know, how do you, how do you expect your students to interact with AI through the lens of your class? And, you know, that might be something that sets you apart from a different candidate. Can you Essence. So thank you for your uh, comments this evening. Um, my question has to do with how do you 
bring up, I guess, these conversations with your colleagues and administrators in your current school, because just in, you know, sitting with other, by my peers and, and the colleagues at work, um, yeah. there's certainly a negative stigma around chat GBT, uh, when it comes to students producing work. Uh, rather than I think a position of curiosity, uh, which I think is a lot more interesting, was kind of assuming that everything around AI is bad, there's good and bad with it, obviously. But how would you, I guess, go about bringing up that conversation um, in the in the workplace with your colleagues, administrators, to kind of open that that door, I guess. So, so I've I've done it. <laughs> so. Um, just, you know, we have kind of planning sessions, sitting around the English office. I've kind of modeled some of it. Actually, it was no secret that I was coming here. So people were asking me, they're curious, but also other people in, um, the English department and other departments that work in our office have modeled things for me, like question well, uh, we could play around with it. And I think if you bring it up kind of casually and you're ready to show people in the element, like this is how we can use it. Uh, we've also discovered some big sales with ChatGPT. If you, you know, you really cannot trust it to make a test for you. <laughs> so I think a lot of it is, is, you know, you can't seem like a salesman for ChatGPT in any way. Um, but, but kind of being playful with it, asking people, uh, one thing I did get out of a student today, by the way, was that they're using it to develop code to buy sneakers for them to sell. <laughs> so, I mean, like students, they, they use it in all different kinds of ways. So I think it's, I think that starting conversations about what you hear from how students are using it makes people, makes other teachers realize that we have to learn this. We can't let the students be ahead of the curve too much. So from that standpoint, knowing the students are using it, talking about like seeing evidence of it, um, and playing around a little bit together, I, I, you know, it's, it shouldn't be too far from that standpoint. Yeah, I think also the people who are like typically host staunchly against it haven't even necessarily really seen it or used it. So even just like if you're just like on your computer and you're just playing around and you're showing that like having a conversation is being like, oh, I did, I did X, Y, and Z, you know, you can kind of show them and it's not as scary as like, oh my gosh, these kids aren't going to do, write anything ever again. They're not going to read anything ever again. There's uh, the other side of it is just like, this is what I use it for. And then you see where the conversation goes because mm -hmm. there's always something that they can, that even people who are against it per se can sort of latch on to and go, oh, I, that's interesting. I didn't know I didn't know it could do that, or I didn't know I could use it for that. So I think that is just sort of sh like just literally showing and having those conversations with people in your department or whoever, uh, I think goes a long way in sort of limiting that stigma. Did you I just want to make one comment to Richard's question. Um, like with many things, new things are scary. And I think to acknowledge the way people feel about things before you get into what we might know about something is often a, a good entry point because you validate the anxiety and the, the fear and the worry. Um, and then from there, after acknowledging how people feel, then you can start to, um, you know, gather some early adopters, help them create some momentum. And when you create, you start to create a positive culture around something, then that, you know, other people start to kind of peer over and say, oh, maybe that this won't be, you know, so bad. Or um, there's a great early article from the Times in January last year called the 35 ways that people are using AI in real life. Uh, if you want to Google that, that was a tool that I had used to spark some conversation just to show that it can be fun, interesting, and useful. Um, but to acknowledge how people feel and that it is a bit scary to start something new, I find is usually a, a great place to start. Um, so we want to thank you so much for being here. Um, we appreciate you and taking time out of your Tuesday afternoon to join us in this conversation. Uh, if you have any other questions or things you want to, to chat with us about, you know, we'll, we'll be sitting up here and we're happy to talk with you. Um, if not, have a wonderful rest of your week and, um, Go try out some chat cheeky teeny little guy. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>